Yep. All right. Good morning. We are we are good to go. So I'd like to convene the meeting and call the order. I'd like to call the uh, June 21st, I'm sorry, 2021 Committee on Accreditation meeting to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Here. Shomaline Balatayo. Here. Kathy Christian. Here. Katrina Chikowski. Here. Cheryl Forbes. Bob Fraley. Here. Mike Hillis. Here. Lynn Larson. Here. Marty Martinez. Anna Moore. Here. Gerard Morrison. Kevin Taylor. Here. Okay, so we do have a quorum. Uh, just a reminder, we're once again conducting this meeting entirely virtually. And just a few reminders before we get started. Most staff and members are participating from their own location, and a few may be in the commission office. The Zoom link has been made available to the public. Regarding Zoom identification, we ask that everyone please check their Zoom ID and be sure it contains your first and last name accurately so we're able to call on you appropriately and also so that we can get all names accurately recorded in the record. If you need to update your name, please click on the three dots in the window with your picture to bring up the rename option. When it is time to take up an item, we will need a moment to bring the appropriate attendees into the main meeting room and make sure they can see and hear the committee and that we can see and hear them as well. Participants will need to turn on their camera and unmute. Regarding microphones, members of the committee are going to be using your micro, I'm sorry, muting your microphones to eliminate any background noise that may get in the way of others hearing what is being said by the speakers. We ask that when you do speak, please unmute yourself, but then once again, when you are done speaking, please go back to being muted. Procedures regarding commenting or asking questions. Committee members, if you wish to make a comment, please either physically raise your hand on camera or use the raise hand feature, which is located at at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you are unable to do either of those options, you can also send a message in the chat feature in order to signal that you have a question or a comment. Several of us will be looking for those comments or questions in the chat and the hands, but please make sure we don't miss you. We wanna be sure we have uh, everybody who wants to say something. Because we are a public body, we must conduct our business in the public forum. We ask that you please do not use the chat feature to make substantive comments or have discussions on any items. Public attendees of this meeting cannot see the chat box, and those who view the video archive of this meeting will also not have access to any of the conversations within the chat. Regarding motions and roll call vote, when you make your motions, please state the motion in full so that there is no question what the motion is. All votes will be conducted via roll call. Just before the vote, we will remind everyone to make sure you are unmuted so that we do not miss anyone's vote. If you are unable to respond via video or audio, you may make your vote known through the chat function. The secretary will have to read your name and your vote when she gets to that part of the roll call vote to make it an official part of the record and also to make sure that the public knows what the vote is. Because this can be quite cumbersome, we would like to leave this as the last option. If you need to leave the meeting for any moment in time, please raise your hand and let us know so we are sure to have a quorum at all times and also so the record can be accurate. Please do the same once you return to the meeting. Regarding public comment, members of the public wishing to provide public comment during the discussion of an agenda item will be given the opportunity to speak during the public comment period for each item and then at the end of the meeting. The committee chair will announce when the public comment period is open during the presentation of the agenda item and will ask for anyone who wishes to comment to notify the meeting moderator as explained below. For, I'm sorry, for participants via Zoom webcast, individuals who join the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raise hand icon to indicate that you would like it to speak on the item. Staff will notify the individual when it is their turn to speak by calling their Zoom ID or the name used by the member of the public when logging into the meeting. At that time, the individual will be prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. As a particular note, the Zoom ID name used by the member of the public to join the Zoom meeting will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. 
for those participants via teleconference. Individuals who join the meeting via the U.S. toll-free number will need to press star 9 on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that they would like to speak on the item. The meeting moderator will notify the individual it is their turn to speak by calling the last four digits of their phone number and will allow them to unmute their microphone. At that time, the individual will be prompted to press star 6 and will be able to share their comment. There is also a time designated for general public comment at the end of the meeting. This meeting is being recorded and after the meeting ends, the archived audio and video will be available via the Commission's website. Do any committee members have any questions regarding these protocols? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on to the approval of the June 21st, I'm sorry, 2021 agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for the June 2021 meeting? And please remember to unmute your microphone when uh, speaking. Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I move that we approve the agenda. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Taylor. The secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joe Malene Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Kresha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Item three is the approval of the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 2021st meeting? And as a reminder, it'd be appropriate for any committee member who was not in attendance at that meeting to abstain. Before we do so, does any member of the public wish to comment on the item? All right, seeing none, is there a motion from a committee member? Motion by Member Hillis. I move that we accept the minutes as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Amos. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amos? Aye. John Lane Balatayo? I abstain. Kathy Krishna? Aye. Katrina Chikowski? Abstain. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Abstain. All right, motion carries. Thank you. We now want to turn the meeting over to the Chief Deputy Director, Amy Rising, who would like to say a few words to and about our outgoing member. Amy? Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you today on a Monday, <laughs> get our week started. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, be with you and to be able to share some thoughts about Dr. Anna Moore and her work with the COA uh, and um, to compliment her on all that she has achieved in her eight years. So on behalf of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, I'd like to thank Dr. Anna Moore for her eight years of service on the Committee on Accreditation and to take a moment <clears throat> to recognize her accomplishments. Dr. Moore came to the committee having been an accomplished teacher, administrator, and induction program director. She has enormous talent and expertise and experience that have been vital to the committee over the many several years. Dr. Moore has served two terms on the Committee of Accreditation, the first beginning July 1st, 2013, and the second term beginning July 1st of 2017. And during this time, Dr. Moore has elected to serve as the co-chair of the committee in 2015-16 and then again in 2017-18. In an unprecedented show of support for her leadership, the committee then voted not once, not twice, but three times to suspend its procedures manual and to re-elect her as, to serve as the co-chair. This speaks volumes to the leadership and competence she has demonstrated over the years in keeping the committee on track in ensuring high quality programs operate in the state of California. 
During Dr. Moore's tenure on the committee, she presided over untold number of accreditation site visits, reports, revisits, follow-up reports, and new program proposals. Too many to count, really, in the eight years, and several very memorable uh, ones at that. In addition, she has helped ensure the implementation of the Commission's vision around change and preparation and accreditation. Some of the significant changes that took place while she was on the committee and for which she helped usher from concept to implementation include induction, moving these programs from their earlier, earlier roots of tasks and activities into the current era, providing deep level of mentoring and support for new teachers, preliminary single subject and multiple subject, and all the changes that have occurred within, performance assessments, new standards, and new clinical practice requirements. Dr. Moore helped us with new common standards, with new emphasis on assessment systems and leadership in our work together. Administration programs, she helped us with implement new standards, performance expectations, the CAPE, and new performance assessments. And finally, the new PPS and SPED standards that are just now being uh, able to take root in California. Quite an amazing set of accomplishments. Dr. Moore has also been instrumental in ensuring the implementation of the Strengthening and Streamlining Project for the accreditation system, which was a monumental task. She was vital in helping the committee and the staff think through the elimination of unnecessary documentation while ensuring the critical aspects of accreditation and incorporating new ideas into the system, as well as the resulting adoption of the new accreditation framework and several iterations of handbook changes over the years. <laughs> Dr. Moore has approached the work of the committee with an unwavering commitment to quality, ensuring that candidates receive the best educational experiences that will prepare them to enter the profession and stay, hopefully, in the profession. The quality of services that K-12 students get is never far from Dr. Moore's thoughts as she considers each and every issue. Her tenure with the commission, uh, Dr. Moore has questioned, probed, and pushed programs to think of hard about their focus, what they're trying to achieve, and whether or not they're doing right by their candidates and the students those candidates will serve. Dr. Moore has always been fair-minded, thoughtful, and supportive of all programs, especially those that came before the commission that were struggling. She has demonstrated unwavering fidelity to the standards. Her commitment most especially to new teachers and to the induction community that support them is unquestioned. Dr. Moore's expertise, experience, and unique leadership will be sorely missed. We wish you, Dr. Moore, uh, well as you leave the committee and we hope that you will be able to contribute to the work of the commission in other ways in the future. We thank you for your many years of service for the long hours spent reading agenda items and giving each one of them careful consideration and for all of the support you've given to the commission staff. As a very small token of our appreciation, the commission will be sending you Dr. Moore a certificate signed by the commission's executive director, Dr. Mary Sandy and the chair, Dr. Tina Sloan, so good luck to you, Dr. Moore, and we will certainly miss you. Thank you for all of your service. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. That was um, very humbling, <laughs> overwhelming. I, no wonder I'm tired. Yes. <laughs> it's been a lot of work, and, and it's really been my pleasure. I, um, this, this really is my heart. Uh, is credentialing and the credentialing system as a means to supporting educators and ultimately students of California. Um, and I uh, just want to take a minute to thank all the people that have been on the COA and supported our work over these years. Um, and of course, my co-chairs and um, the most longstanding co-chair with me is uh, uh, Dr. Feli. It's been amazing. Uh, the PSD division, uh, we, I know Bob and I say it at almost every meeting how impressed and amazed we are at the work that you do. Um, and, and we could, all those amazing things you said uh, about me go right back to the PSD because that is who we are together. And what we do is that unwavering um, work with fidelity and heart and attention to detail and 
hours. Um, and always with just, for lack of a better word, joy. I mean, it, it just feels important. It's, it's, it's good stuff. And uh, I just want to thank you. And um, yes, I look forward to serving in other ways and um, being part of the system of the CCTC uh, as we move forward and continue to support um, what we do for teachers, administrators, and the students of California. So thank you for the opportunity. It's been my pleasure. Well, we will miss you and we thank you and good luck with your new adventures. <laughs> Whatever they may be. <laughs> we Whatever they may be. <laughs> all right, Thanks. I'm gonna get thank on you, to other Amy. things, but I hope you all have a great meeting today. Thank you, Amy. Hi, right. thanks, Amy. Um, my computer froze. I, Anna, I hope you can hear. Um, yes. Can you can all? Hear. Okay. Anna, it has been a remarkable experience working with you. Um, you have been phenomenal as a leader. You have been phenomenal as a friend and working together in this, in this uh, situation is one that I will never forget. We're going to miss you a, a lot. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm always impressed with is that when we sit side by side at these meetings here and I look at your agenda and I look at your handouts and I look at all the notes that you have and everything that you've made to pay attention to what's going on and all the all the detail and things that I might may have overlooked um, and you leave no stone unturned and I think you are of anybody that I've ever known has been on the committee you've been the one who looks at everything with extreme detail uh, because it's important and that's how you approach every aspect of the job. Um, we're going to miss the cupcakes and the good stuff you bring to the meetings. So uh, we'll, ha we'll have to find time to get together, hopefully, when we are all done and face-to-face. -face and you're not too far, so maybe you, you don't mind taking that drive. Maybe one more time we can all do a farewell dinner on your behalf and kind of get together and just kind of more relaxed atmosphere. But again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Um, and you will be sorely missed. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as I was reflecting this morning, I'm like uh, thinking about uh, all those years of being in Sacramento. And this is just such a crazy way to, to end things. Um, but uh, I, I hear an ice cream um, calling to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. Yep. Um, does any other... I'm, and I apologize, I'm at the University for Better Connection and it's actually worse. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you can hear me, but does any other committee member wish to make any comment? And Luke, uh, Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, th thanks, Bob. Yeah. Well, um, I'm a relatively new member of the COA and, and I just wanted to make a, a comment about the importance of communicating the, the cultural norms and the values of this of this group and how it how it relates to the CTC and larger efforts in California in general. And Bob and Anna's leadership since I've been on the COA has been instrumental in that regard, communicating what it is that this that this organization's about, um, the values of continuous improvement, and that when you don't measure up to the standards, you're not a failing program. One of the things I'm always going to remember about Anna is how she addresses stressed out presenters at the COA, um, representatives of teams who are clearly afraid that they're going to get roasted in public. And she's she's disarming. She's empathetic. I keep thinking of her with like nine different second graders, like grabbing at her pants. And I'm just thinking how lucky we are to have this person who's obviously magic at a school site um, bring that magic with her to this policy and process forum. So Anna, you've been an example for me and countless others. So thank you very much. I think that's an image I'm gonna remember now, nine second graders grabbing your pant leg. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, Member Taylor. Um, Member Kachowski said Member Taylor? it really, really well. Um, and uh, I, I, Anna, I just want to add my uh, uh, words of um, uh, respect, uh, admiration, uh, gratitude uh, for all that you have brought to uh, the COA over the years. Uh, I'm a very new uh, member to it, uh, but uh, always uh, looked 
and I've only ever done them via Zoom. So I've always looked to your tile <laughs> for uh, leadership uh, and support and uh, just a, a deep sense that um, uh, you had the knowledge and um, you, you, your calm uh, demeanor was going to support us uh, through this process. And so thank you uh, for your leadership uh, personally and behalf on behalf of uh, <clears throat> the Central Coast of California, um, because uh, it, it's uh, really been a, uh, a, a gift and an important uh, contribution to the state. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Anna, for your service. My pleasure. Thank you for your words. I appreciate it. Uh, Member Larson. I just want to echo what everyone else has said. Um, I can't add a whole lot more to that, but just as a, again, as a new member on the commission this year, it's always helpful to know that the people who are running the meetings and in charge of the meetings are thoughtful, compassionate, detail-oriented leaders who have your back and have the program's backs. And um, we know that we're here as a, an advisory um, committee providing information to the programs about ways things are doing well and things they need to improve upon. And sometimes those messages can be tough to hear, but they are always delivered with such compassion and kindness and detail that programs knew exactly what they needed to do and knew that they had um, a voice in the process as well. So um, you're a model of leadership that others can learn from. And so I really appreciate getting to know you, even though it was just virtually this past year, I would have liked to have the opportunity to meet you in person. And hopefully we do have that opportunity sometime in this next year. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I, I, I too hope we can meet in person. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody, Member Balatayo, did I see your hand? Hi, Anna. Um, I have seen you all through these years. Um, you've been a consistent, um, very you know, compassionate, empathetic leader. Thank you for being that leader for all of us. Um, and I value the advice that you've given me all through these years. Um, and I hope that we keep in touch. I'm gonna keep this short because we have, a, you know, we have a long meeting ahead of us, but thank you very much for all that you've done for us and for me personally. And I hope that we continue to stay in touch. Thank you. Me too. It's been fun, Jo <laughs> Well, Anna, your day's not done yet. You still got work ahead of you, so we're not gonna we're not gonna let you go just yet. Um, and we'll give them an opportunity for anybody else who wish to make a comment, maybe at the end of our meeting today. But um, you've heard the outpouring of of sincere thoughts and wishes. So um, again, it, we we. Couldn't have done this without you. We're going to miss you, um, but you still got work, so we'll keep <laughs> we'll keep you going here. Um, but again, thanks, Anna. I have notes to look at. <laughs> That's okay. Well, we're going to move on right to now. <laughs> That's true. We're looking forward to those. Um, let's move on to item five. Then item actually, my party item four. Um, item four on the agenda is the co-chair and member reports. Do any members have anything they wish to report? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item five. Item five is staff reports. We have updates from Ms. Hickey, Ms. Sullivan, and Mr. DeGear. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step out and quickly try to fix my internet connection. Um, and Ms. Hickey, will you please begin? Sure, absolutely. Um, so you're all probably exhausted from the school year this year. That's why it was so quiet during, <laughs> during the other reports. But uh, um, we have a few things we wanted to report on um, just to kind of bring everybody up to speed on, on various things. We um, staff, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of me and staff, and I'm sure staff will want to jump in. Anna, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. And I wanted to thank you for all the support you've given to us over the years. Um, you know, the way you've reached out when you know things are challenging has been really extraordinary. I mean, on a personal level, you reached out to me when my parents were passing away and, and all of those things. And I really, really value the humanity in who you are. And, um, you know, you've always been very compassionate and um, empathetic and, and really, really um, have always valued that. 
in you. And I, I want to thank you for your leadership on the commission and, and helping us through the tough times and some, some challenging uh, <laughs> reports and challenging issues. So thank you for all of that. Um, and hope we stay in touch. Hope we uh, have a chance to work together in the future. So um, just a few other things um, that I wanted to mention. Um, so we just got off of two days of a very long commission meeting. <laughs> the rest of the staff can vouch for that. We went well into that late afternoon on Friday. Um, we had many, many items. Um, and I think that's because a lot is happening right now. Um, I want to maybe pass this to, let's start with Kara. Um, so, you know, it's budget season right now at, the, at the, the state legislature, and there's been a lot of talk this year about teacher recruitment, our teacher shortage, the fact that COVID is um, exasperating or it, it, um, is um, making worse the, um, the, the teacher shortage. We're hearing a lot from CalSTRS about retirements and those numbers being up this coming year. Um, so the legislature has been really focused on teacher recruitment. Um, so, Kara, do you want to mention what's happening in that area? Oh, we can't hear you, Kara. Can you guys hear her? Okay, let's How about go. now? There we go. All right. Good morning, everyone. I said really nice things about Anna when I was off. <laughs> it's also. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure to serve with you, and I wish you the best in all your future endeavors, for sure. So well done, thank you. All right, so we have some excellent news um, from the governor and from the legislature relative to grants. Um, I don't know if anyone was following the commission, the very long commission meeting last week, but we had um, a presentation on the, the, it was an outside evaluation of the classified grant program. Um, lots of um, positivity around that particular program. Uh, we had um, several recommendations that uh, were already in the hopper that we were thinking about as a staff relative to the next round of classified grants because we do have another round of classified grants coming up um, beginning, you know, when the budget um, hits the road uh, July 1st. So in January, the governor had proposed $25 million for classified grants, but in the May revise, uh, that particular number was up to 125 million for classified grants. So uh, this is an opportunity for our LEAs to have a grow your own program, to uh, reach out to uh, paraprofessionals, uh, kitchen help, bus drivers, anyone else who has a, an, um, an interest and the fortitude <laughs> to become a teacher. And, uh, you know, with the concept that uh, there are individuals in our community working with our kids and to what degree we can um, support them in a path to becoming a teacher and educator in, um, that, in that LEA district. So um, LEAs may receive up to 24,000 per participating classified employee um, and uh, participating classified employees must commit to working in uh, a public school teacher for at least four years. So uh, there's some really great ideas coming relative to classified grant and priority will be given to LEAs that previously did not receive this particular grant. So uh, lots of enthusiasm and funds for um, promoting our classified employees and growing our own in our um, local LEAs. Uh, teacher residency grant programs are also very uh, well regarded. Uh, there has been, um, in December, there was a commission um, agenda item relative to the first year of teacher residencies, and um, uh, West Ed is doing um, a study of our, of all of the grantees, uh, teacher residency programs, and there was some very compelling data in that particular uh, commission item in, in December, and especially that uh, the teacher residency programs are, um, there's a, a, a large percentage of our uh, underrepresented teachers, uh, teachers of color are joining the teacher residency program. So it's very exciting news. Um, in January, the governor proposed $550 million for teacher residency. And we all kind of went, because <gasps> <laughs> that's a lot of funds and so, so excited about that. However, in the May revise that was reconfigured to 250 million, which is still, 
a good amount of money above the 75 million that was originally proposed back in 2018-19. So we're so excited um, about the expansion, the potential expansion of teacher residency programs here in California. Um, grantees can receive up to 25,000 per participant. Um, however, they, the LEAs or the grantees need only match 20,000. So prior to the original um, uh, funds in the 2018-19 budget, it was a one-to-one -one match, um, but this time it's uh, a little bit uh, different. It's 25,000 per participating and 20,000 per uh, for the match. Um, of course, residencies pair those new teachers with that experienced mentor. Um, and there will be a, a focus on the designated shortage fields, which include special education, bilingual education, STEM, um, transitional kindergarten, and other fields. So we're very excited about the potential of um, teacher residency programs continuing here in the state. And one last uh, grant that's gonna be new is the Computer Science Supplementary Authorization Incentive Grant. And this um, it establishes a new $15 million grant. Was I saying thousand before? Anyhow, $15 million grant program available over a five-year period to increase the number of current teachers authorized to teach computer science. So, um, we will be able to share more about this particular grant as uh, time passes, but uh, be on the lookout for that. Participating teachers will be eligible for up to 2,500 from LEAs towards the cost of coursework or books or fees or tuition um, to um, earn their authorization in computer science. So we're very excited, um, lots of opportunity to grow and for our LEAs to um, be able to be in the mix straight up on recruiting and retaining our teachers. So we're excited. Pass it back it's, to you, Cheryl. Thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting. There are, um, there's a couple little other things. Um, I shouldn't say little, but there's the, the commission doesn't um, administer this, but there's also more funding for the Golden State Teacher Grant that is out of the um, Student Aid Commission. So there'll be that, um, as well as $2 million for um, commission approved programs to relook at their curriculum around dyslexia. Um, and, and we're not completely sure of all the provisions related to that, but um, it looks like it may be available for all preliminary programs um, to kind of take another look and make sure that they're covering dyslexia appropriately. Um, so no, yeah, really you, exciting time. Go ahead, Kara. Sorry, did you want me to um, mention the regional centers also? Yes, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so there was a, an original proposal um, for this pretty um, cohesive roadmap to teaching um, proposed uh, for 111 million, that was in January, but that has been cut back to uh, 40 million to create recruitment and support centers regionally throughout California um, uh, that will support educator candidates at all points of their preparation and employment process um, who are express, expressing interest in going into um, education. Uh, the, the commission will have a grant relative to those regional centers, um, and there will be a steering committee that is, oh, a steering committee, an opportunity for Anna, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> she has yeah. nothing better to do. <laughs> a steering committee um, who will provide guidance on the components and flexibilities and so on. So again, more around that to be rolling out. Uh, it's brand new, and so we'll see. What, what comes of that. So we're kind of excited also. Yeah. Well, back to you. Do I see a, a question from Katrina Tchaikovsky? Yeah, that, that's cool stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm of course thinking of my own district, which it just finished its second year of teacher residency. Um, but I'm just wondering to what degree my district, which is the state's largest secondary district, um, is is representative at all of districts that did not hire a significant number of new teachers? And is there any map someplace that mm. demonstrates where the teaching shortage is particularly acute? Clearly there's a lot of students of color in my district who are not benefiting from the new teachers that came through our teacher residency program, but our residents went out into the California world and have been serving students in other districts. So I think that that's something that I would be very interested in. And I would think that residency planners would be looking ahead at that. I do think that there is, I mean, I know that the residents in my district um, 
you know, responded to West Ed surveys and they were quite positive about their experience and what they learned. Even the completers were like, yeah, I was well prepared, but they didn't come to stay with us. We had actually a reduction in the teaching force in our district. So maybe we're just one off, like it's just weird stuff, but maybe the cost of living in California is inordinately affecting certain communities where marginalized communities of students are now doubly affected if that makes any sense to anybody here, like instead of having access to these diverse new progressive educators that are coming out of residency, the students are um, subject to just the status quo or a reduction in new talent in general. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, California's factors that affect how and where residents work. So I'd be interested in, in knowing more about that like even mapping it out with color codes. I, I can see that, but. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think that the whole issue of the teacher shortage and teacher diversity is so localized. I mean, I've heard from a number of, um, of districts this year who are telling us that they have lost enrollment, um, you know, and so it's for them, it's not a matter of, uh, of needing new teachers, <laughs> they're um, they're losing kids, you know, to what for whatever reasons, and it's a variety of reasons. It's very localized, I think, very different across the state. So it's really um, interesting. But I think the commission has definitely got on its agenda to look at residencies and the impact of residencies over the next few years. I mean, certainly that's on Kara's plate for sure. <laughs> and you know, where these where these teachers are going and what they're doing. So. Um, I wanted to, um, I, there was a pretty big monumental moment. It didn't feel like it, but to those of us who have been around for a while, re realized it on Friday um, when the commission approved some emergency regulations. So I want to ask David to talk a little bit about that related to subject matter. So David. So there has been a bill in the legislature this past session, uh, AB 437, <laughs> which would provide two additional options for candidates to demonstrate their subject matter competence. One would be through purely coursework, uh, meaning that preparation programs could do a transcript review with a subject matter expert to see if the, all the domains of the subject matter requirements have been met through coursework. The other is a combination of coursework and uh, subtests of the CSAT. So it's, it's kind of a moving target still. Um, language from this bill has been put into the trailer bill, but uh, we understand that there are still negotiations going on regarding what the final language will be. Um, so what we presented to the commission on Friday was our, recommenda our, our recommendations for um, emergency regulations to allow these new options to go into effect as soon as possible. So um, the language that we presented may need to be um, edited a bit based on the final trailer bill language. Um, but the emergency regulation process provides for a shortened public comment period and a shortened review period by the Office of Administrative Law. So the bottom line is that we could have um, emergency regulation in place by the middle of August so that candidates and prep programs um, can take advantage of these new options. We would still need to go through the regular rulemaking process to make these permanent, um, but these are some pretty exciting opportunities for candidates uh, that I think will both um, help some candidates who have been stuck in the pipeline because they haven't been able to take tests uh, with testing center closures and uh, um, the reduced um, capacity of, of testing centers. But then also, I think it's also gonna help us diversify our, our teaching core overall because we know that there are people who just do not test well. Uh, we see that in our K-12 students. We try to provide them multiple measures, and this is an effort to provide multiple measures for teacher candidates. 
Cheryl, you're I would, Yeah, sorry. So I would just say that there's a lot of questions about this, a lot of details, a lot of um, things that programs want to know. Well, you know, if my candidate does X, Y, or Z, would this count? So we're working on all those details. We're hoping to have a variety of resources for programs so that when these emergency regs kind of roll out, um, programs would know, you know, what's within the lane now. Because, you know, when can you accept coursework or, you know, can you accept a major um, and what does that look like? What kind of majors can you accept for subject matter um, competence? Um, so there's a lot of questions um, and we are working on all of those questions and trying to make sure that they have answers so that when it rolls out, we have everything ready for programs to just get up and start, start doing what they need to do. Um, because we know that there's a lot of candidates who are kind of stuck in this moment because of COVID and having to not, not have been able to take certain exams over the past um, 15 months. So, and then at the same time, Kara has been working with Pearson to make testing more accessible to candidates. So, you know, an at-home online proctoring option for some um, programs is rolling out at the moment um, for both CBEST, I believe, and CSET. We've started with multiple subjects. Is that right, Kara? Multiple subject, um, one and three. Mm, one and three, right. yeah, and then English uh, one through four. Right. Mm -hmm. And there'll right. be more rolling out as, as we go. So while there'll be more options, there's lots more questions because there are more options. But that I think this is, in the end, it's really going to benefit candidates, I think, um, to be right. able to demonstrate competence um, in a number of where In that same trailer bill language, it doesn't get as much attention um, because it's, it's not as... Um, convoluted or di difficult to understand or to figure out where the pieces are, but it, there's also the basic skills aspect of it. So um, basically it would allow coursework for basic skills as long as a candidate has a B or better in certain, um, certain categories. And that would be up to the program to determine whether or not the candidate has done that. In many, many cases, I think somebody with a college degree could probably um, have coursework that meets that as long as they get a B or better. So there'll be um, some, again, guidance coming from the commission um, once those trailer bills pass. And it, you know, the budget is, is supposed to be signed and passed and ready to go on July 1. Sometimes I think the trailer bills take a little longer to get the details in place. So we are working really closely um, you know, to adjust the guidance we give once we know what's actually in the final bill. But yeah, but that was one of David's big uh, accomplishments right in his first few months with the commission. So kudos. Katrina. Yeah, so just real fast, gosh, Kara, when you're like talking about that, I thought of the spreadsheet that we have to assemble for residency with multiple tabs. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to have to like expand that content thing with multiple options. And then I saw the drop down menu changing. Anyway, so you see the, the accountability thing has been firmly imprinted on residency grant grantees. Um, I was just going to ask about Rika. How does how does Rika fit into this? Is it head, Kara? Get out of my head, Katrina, because I was going to say, Cheryl, <laughs> do you want me to talk about Rika? So uh, <laughs> currently uh, for the um, administrations coming up, uh, Rika has been reconfigured. So it's now a three uh, subtest test rather than one big test. So the hope is that it will, um, when folks are just taking one test at a time, there might be um, increased uh, opportunity at the testing centers for others to jump in. And then also um, when in the event that um, a, a, a examinee needs to retake a portion of the RECA or the RECA, uh, he or she will only have to take a portion, you know, whichever subtest. So it will be, you know, for those who may have to, who aren't successful on their first try and they may have to retake, um, they will have the opportunity to only have to, you know, retake one or two or whichever portions of that, whichever of those subtests to do that. And so it's a cost savings also. So, um, and then there will be um, some reconfiguring or some updating of RECA to really, um, really examine it um, by 2025, I believe. I believe, yeah. The mm -hmm. date has kind of mushed around a couple of times. So I think it's 2025 there. Um, will be potentially a, a revised RECA. Strikes and I hope. believe that is, um, is it SB or AB 488? Um, it's one of those two. Um, but there is a bill um, to um, change 
uh, RICA, the contents of RICA. We um, have been working on look, kind of reevaluating the content specs and, and, and uh, just kind of seeing where they would need to be updated. Um, so we've had some expert help kind of helping us do some background work while we try to figure out if money's coming. So the commission should be getting some money, um, $2 million to relook at uh, RICA over the next few years. Um, SB and to, 488. Ruby, 488. SB? SB 488. SB 488. Well, just, just in, I, I asked that because of all the factors that seem to be truncating the development of high, high need teachers, particularly mild mod education specialists, RICA is at the forefront of hurdles. I mean, it's seriously the thing. I've, I've watched people teaching as interns for multiple years only to stumble on the RICA. And yeah, it's, it's an impediment that I'm sure if it's affecting my district the way it is, it's statewide. So thank you for that work. Um, and the other thing I just want to mention in that context for all of these changes is that we do need to think about where in the accreditation process and this is this will be where the COA will come in directly on this. Um, where and how do we verify that programs are verifying that each candidate has subject matter and basic skills um, now that there are more options? So you have to think about that. Um, we have been looking and we think it fits perfectly within Common Standard 1 where there is a, you know, no one is recommended unless they've accomplished all of the requirements of that credential. Um, but we're also thinking, do we need to revisit the preconditions? Um, so there'll be work done over the summer because we may need an August agenda item to the commission to change preconditions if we feel like we need to or what. But the staff is still evaluating that and waiting for the final language to come through on subject matter. So um, that's um, that's where we are with those things. There are so, so much going on at the moment <coughs> in and around exams and grants. Um, and I just wanted to give Aaron a chance to say anything about the accreditation process because we've got lots going. Go ahead. Aaron. Thank you, Cheryl. So um, good morning, everyone. We, um, we are wrapping up basically um, year five for institutions in the Violet cohort. So they began the year by submitting program review. Uh, they submitted common standards review in the spring. Uh, for the most part, all of that work is, is completed and those institutions will begin having their site visits in October. We've also um, begun working with the Indigo uh, cohort. They will be submitting program review in, uh, in October and of course, common standards review in the spring. Um, it's, a, it's a just slightly smaller cohort with about 32 institutions in it at the moment. Violet was pretty large with 34 um, so, you know, if you're feeling a little bit uh, tired, it's because you've seen a lot of site visit <laughs> reports this year. Um, it included with our regular cohorts, of course, we are really seeing our provisional site visits ramping up. You will notice, obviously, that you have three provisional site visit reports on your uh, agenda today. We have, um, I believe, four more in the fall and then another three next spring. So um, those new institutions and the new programs that they're offering, um, that work is really beginning to ramp up. Um, so that is what is occurring right now with, um, with site visits. And if I just do a little bird walk, since I mentioned provisional site visits, um, I just, it's been, a, it's been a little while since there has been a provisional site visit before this committee. Um, and as I said, you do have three of them today. So if you'll just allow me for a moment, we were trying to figure out kind of where was a good place to just kind of do a refresher for this. And we decided at the beginning of the meeting would be, um, would be a good time to do it during staff updates. So um, you will have the first provisional site visit report um, right after items six, seven, and eight this morning. So item nine is the site visit report for High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, that's item 10. And then we have the provisional site visit report for UC Merced, which is item 17. So that'll be later today. And finally, Las Virginis Unified School District, item 19. So again, just as a little refresher, because you've seen just one, provisional site visits occur during stage five of the initial institutional approval process, which is the final stage. Um, 
IIA is a five-stage multi-year process for prospective program sponsors that want to become commission-approved institutions. Since the time that the IIA process was revised a number of years ago by uh, Cheryl and um, uh, Lynette Roby, you may remember our consultant Lynette Roby, we've had just one institution so far complete all five stages, and that was Turlock Unified School District. Uh, Terry Clark was the consultant assigned to that visit since it was our uh, first ever provisional site visit. And she and team lead Barbara Howard presented the item, uh, uh, the team's report at last June's commission meeting. So it's been a full year since you've had a provisional site visit report in front of you. Um, as a reminder with provisional site visit reports, the COA is not taking action on the recommendation of the team, but rather the discussing the team's recommendation um, and questioning the institution, you know, in whatever manner um, is appropriate for you, as if it were an accreditation report for a regular site visit. Um, in other words, so the questions to keep in mind are, you know, what would be the accreditation decision the COA would have taken if this were a regular site visit? Then this information about your discussion um, will be taken before the commission along with this site visit report. Um, and the commission will make the final determination at that time on whether to grant or deny the institution full institutional approval. Uh, granting full institutional approval would mean that the institution is now part of the commission's accreditation system. It will be assigned to a color cohort and will be responsible for adhering to the seven-year accreditation cycle. Um, if the site visit report from the provisional site visit includes stipulations, uh, if the commission approves the institution to become part of our regular accreditation cycle and be assigned to a color cohort, the institution then will be remanded back to the COA for the follow-up of um, any um, stipulations that are in the report, and that will include any, you know, quarterly reports, or if there is a um, uh, a seventh year report or or a revisit that needs to occur. So the institution would come will come back to um, to the COA as part of the process for follow up. So with that in mind, um, just I would like to mention the process that led up to these provisional site visits. Um, and we are making some modifications to this process moving forward. We've had some conversations with um, the consultants that um, were part of these provisional site visits this last spring and the consultants that will have them in the fall. Um, so, but for the three institutions that you're seeing today, within six months of their site visit, they were asked to submit in this order a program review response, which mirrors the program reviews that are submitted by institutions in year five of their cycle. Uh, responses to both the general and program-specific preconditions, and a common standard submission. So they submitted all of these things within six months leading up to their site visit. Most institutions get um, a year to a year and a half, depending on when their site visit is scheduled. The program review responses were reviewed by the entire team, um, as were the common standards responses. So both the common standards reviewers and the program sampling team members came together to review the entire program review response and the entire common standards review response. Um, this is in an effort to provide the entire team with the greatest extent of knowledge possible about the institution and its programs. Um, so it's a really rich process of program review and common standards review with that whole team there. Within 30 days of receipt of the submission, um, the review occurs and feedback is provided to the institution. So the timeline is also tight for the team. So we got program review within 30 days. We had we scheduled the entire team to review that. We got feedback back to the institution. Um, when we got common standards submission, we the whole team got together within 30 days, reviewed it, and got that information back to the institution. Um, and that's important because that feedback provides the the institution with information on its preliminary alignment to all the applicable program and common standards. And they then still, um, as with, I would say, our uh, what I've been calling our seven-year accreditation institutions, um, the, the provisional sites, um, provisional institutions also prepare addendum responses that are available to the team um, prior to the site visit. Um, 
let's see. I'm sorry, I had some notes and I went off script, which is fine, but now I'm, I just don't want to forget to give you something important. Okay, now that's, that's it. So it just, I really wanted to provide some emphasis on um, the abbreviated timeline that these institutions underwent. And again, also let the COA know that and, and the other institutions listening that um, Cheryl and I did have a meeting with the consultants and talked about um, ways to modify this so, so that um, the burden on basically everybody, the consultant, the team, the institution is alleviated a little bit. Um, so we will start this process a little bit earlier as needed um, in the future. So I just want to thank the institutions who, you know, have been the first through this process for working with us, um, abiding by these timelines in an amazing way, being so cooperative and so responsive. Um, and of course, you, you will hear the presentations from them. Um, starting later this morning. So thank you. Cheryl, did I leave anything out for you? No, I think that's great. Um, we just wanted to cover that um, for you because you've only seen one of these come through and now you're going to start to see them more regularly. So um, we did skip over Mike Hillis who had a question in his hand up, we, which we missed. I'm, oh, I apologize for that. And, um, but uh, it, I don't know if anybody has questions for Aaron. And I think after that, that, that concludes our staff report. Dr. Well, Hillis, Cheryl, do you still have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just curious with the uh, content equivalency, is, mm. is the plan to actually have a like state template um, for covering that or would that be up to uh, the various institutions to come up with their own? That's a really good question. We um, have subject matter domains that have been decided by, um, you know, and adopted by the commission that guide the development of both the CSET exams and the subject matter programs. And so we will put out, and those are at a very, um, very grant, tight granule level. We don't need, we don't think you need to look at that granule level. So we're pulling it up to the, the domain level, um, but the institution will, we are putting together a document that has everything together. Um, and you will look at that document against their transcripts and see if, you know, if they're an engineering major and they've taken this course, does it match, you know, what, what they need for this? So it will be up to the institutions in consultation with a subject matter experts. And, and David's been working on the definition of a subject matter expert, um, somebody with a master's degree in the field. Um, so if you have a subject matter program, ideally, those are the best people to use. If you don't have a subject matter program, but you have an academic field in, in the area of whatever it is, biology, science, whatever, then you can use that person. But um, it'll be up to the institution to determine who that person is and then the alignment. Um, and that's where the accreditation process comes into play is we need to make sure that programs are doing it in accordance with whatever the commission determines. David, I see you. Go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, we're trying to anticipate as many questions as we as possible right now, but we will miss some. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these processes are going to evolve. Yeah. Um, and so we will be looking for feedback from programs to say, you know, this part's working well, but this part doesn't make sense. Help us with that. And these are emergency regs. So we, they can theoretically be in effect for about a year, but we need to pursue permanent regs. And so this sort of beginning part will help us shape the, the more permanent regulation process and working with all of you. Yes, Katrina. Or, uh, this, this, might be, this might be like stating the obvious, but it really seems though that, that teacher credentialing in those fields that you mentioned, Cheryl, like, you know, those were traditional one subject, one major kinds of very old school um, indicators of, of subject matter competence. Those don't really map super well onto the CSU and UC entrance requirements that teachers really are tasked to help students meet. So there's a strong relationship that I see between how the CSU and UC determine college eligibility and teacher credentialing. You might not you know, those might seem like disparate things. So that's something to think about. And then also, um, you know, I think it's really imperative to acknowledge the value of interdisciplinary study, especially mm -hmm. now. I mean, there's no end of frameworks, you know, PK-12, et cetera, about 
um, you know, the value of, of subject interconnectedness. And when you revert mm -hmm. to these traditional biology, then you're omitting somebody who might have a major in human biology or something that is not a pure uh, single subject. I mean, that happened to me 30 years ago, you know, with a, with a bachelor of science in foreign service, like they didn't know what to do with me. And I ended up taking right. the tests, you know, math, English, yep. social studies. So I could teach lots of things. I mean, San Diego state wasn't even going to let me in. Right. Cause right. I didn't have subject matter authorization. So, you know, hopefully things have evolved and interdisciplinary, I think multiple measures, obviously, you know, multiple paths right. um, is a way to go because, you know, yeah. new ways of thinking and new credentialing. In the, in well, and you, you've touched on something really important in this evolution because um, we started probably a year ago talking about accepting academic majors and, you know, looking at the plethora of majors that could possibly exist. You know, I just took CSULA and just plopped it down. They have 55 majors. And then within those, of course, you have all sorts of iterations of various majors. And so how do you determine subject matter based on that? So, so that's why there are, new, there are several different um, iterations of the options here. And it, it, it will take some work on the part of the institutions to determine um, alignment with those subject matter domains, but, um, but it's getting there, opening the door a little bit wider for people not to, not to have to, you know, to go any one path, that this mix and match of coursework or, or exams, so. Okay, that's it for the staff. I know that was a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but good, we got some good information out there. Yeah, pardon me. Yeah, really good information. And um, it's exciting to hear there are options. We're finding out that one size doesn't necessarily fit all, but also that along the way that there are going to be checkpoints that ensure the standards are still going to be met. I uh, just give me some flexibility. So I think that those are some very good information. Uh, Good pro progress, developments, and great info. So thank you. Um, we are a bit behind in the schedule. We know we have a 9:30 time certain. We thank those who are waiting in the wings for, to be joining us. We were going to get to you. We are going to move on to item six because we do have some others um, and the next several items who are waiting to join us as well. So we're going to move on to item six, which is program approval recommendations. Um, and there are two items for this agenda items. Please refer to both of these together. There are program approvals. This uh, section is for action. There are three institutions with four programs for approval. We have representatives from the three institutions with us to join, <clears throat> pardon me, to answer any questions you may have about the proposed programs. Uh, it might be best to take it one by one and then we can vote for each one individually. Uh, so let's begin with the San Diego County Office of Education for an education specialist, deaf and hard of hearing intern pathway and a preliminary single subject intern pathway. Joining us today to answer any questions about the proposed programs for San Diego County Office of Education are Jana Anderson, Project Specialist, Teacher Effectiveness and Preparation, Dr. Connie Campbell, Coordinator for Teacher Effectiveness and Preparation, Chris Rising, Executive Director of Human Resources, and Dr. Shibe Jones, Director of Human Resources, Teacher Effectiveness and Preparation. Do we have any recusals on this item? Okay, seeing none, would the institutional representatives like to say anything about the proposed program? We just would like to thank you for your time in, in uh, reviewing it and approving it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones. Anybody else wish to make a comment? All right, seeing none, any member of the public wish to comment on the item? I'm not seeing any hands in public comment. All right, thank you. Uh, any committee members have any questions for the representatives from San Diego County Office of Education? Member Tchaikovsky. Hey, homies. Well, hi from San Diego. Um, I think that that I can, I just wanted to commend you for um, you know forging a pathway to build exactly the kinds of teachers we were just talking about earlier today when we were talking about residency. The only thing I would say, as um, a person very familiar with induction, is that as interns are thrown into the pool with both feet, I would I would strongly encourage um, you to consider. Um, 
like a part-time placement. I, I didn't see language re regarding how people would be placed as interns um, in your program. I, I would say that there are a number of intern programs at work in my district. And um, I think having the possibility of a part-time intern placement instead of full-time placement offers a lot of benefits, not only to the intern, but to the school district. It's much easier to carve out time for an intern to work with experienced mentors when they're not teaching full-time. So let's just keep in mind that our interns are often our most vulnerable uh, new teachers. They're more vulnerable than a new teacher who's completed their preliminary credential. And yet they have less time to receive support from colleagues than, than virtually any other new teachers. So um, I think it's, I, I support, you know, as many pathways to generating uh, credentials for high demand teachers. Um, I just, I'm, I'm wary of the demands of intern teachers. May I comment? Oh, Thank sure, you. certainly, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Katrine. I really appreciate your insight because we do have um, interns in your district and all over San Diego County and um, noted, well noted, we are very happy to place interns um, in 50% positions. It's not a common offering from the school districts, but I think together um, we can um, really promote that idea because um, there's no question that the better the support in the beginning, um, the more successful they'll be. So yes, our interns can be placed part-time um, if those are available by the school districts. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Any other committee member have any comment or question? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. So is there a motion to approve the programs for San Diego County of Edu Office of Education? Uh, member Tchaikovsky. I, yeah, I move that we approve the um, request from San Diego County Office of Education uh, to initiate preliminary single subject intern pathway. Great, thank you. So moved. Is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. Would the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almas. Aye. Jomaline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky. Oh, aye. Sorry. <laughs> Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. All right. Motion carries. Congratulations. Um, Bob, can I, or <clears throat> Chair, can I ask uh, for a point of clarification? I just want to make sure that was for both the hard of hearing, deaf and hard of hearing, and for the preliminary single subject. Member Tchaikovsky, was that your motion? Yeah, I can I can amend that to include both hard of hearing and uh, preliminary single subject. Okay, I just wanted to make sure right. that was the case. Sure, and then Balatai, would you accept that as a second? Yes. I believe you second. Okay, all right. Any other committee member wish to change their vote? Okay, seeing then, motion carries. So congratulations. And again, thank you for joining us and for your patience, we appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Our right, next program proposal is from the University of California, Berkeley for a teacher induction program. Joining us to answer any questions you may have about the proposed program for the University of California, Berkeley, are Jacob Diston, BE3 STEM Pathway Lead and Induction Coordinator, and Dr. Lisa Salison, BE3 Operations Lead. Are there any recusals? All right, seeing none, any members of the public wish to offer any comment? I see no public like awesome. comment. All right, thank you. Any committee members have any questions for the representatives of UC Berkeley? Can I, can I just, just out of curiosity, I, I would be interested in knowing um, how you see this program filling a need that's currently unmet in your region regarding new teachers. Yes, thank you for the question. I'd be happy to uh, to address that. Um, first, just thanks to the whole committee for considering our application and uh, for for the review. Um, so, 
uh, BE3 is, is a one-year program, uh, and we're really looking for ways to extend the support um, and coordinate the support that, that our program provides our, our candidates, um, and to work in partnership with, with the local districts in the East Bay. Um, and so uh, the idea is to begin um, by creating, uh, by strengthening, deepening those partnerships for our own graduates, uh, both in their pre-service year and uh, through induction, so that we can work with uh, those districts that most of our our uh, candidates take jobs in. Um, and then down the road, think about uh, how we can also serve uh, other candidates who didn't come through BE3, um, but who are interested in um, some of the, the, um, the sort of principles and, and values that uh, BE3 stands for. Um, the idea of meeting needs that that uh, are yet as of yet unmet uh, with with our sort of major districts that we partner with with Oakland with Hayward uh, with Berkeley um, there are there are just shortages in terms of mentors in STEM in the STEM pathways uh, at many school sites um, as well as I think a a, a sort of um, often a just the continuity between the types of support, the types of, um, of, of goal, uh, working towards uh, professional learning goals for candidates in the pre-service year and in, the, and in induction. And so we're, we're looking to really partner with these districts to create continuity uh, between these phases of uh, teacher development. Thanks. Yeah. Pardon me. Any other committee member have any question or comment? All right. Seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the UC Berkeley Teacher Induction Program? Motion by Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I move that we um, approve the proposal by UC Berkeley for teacher induction. All right. Thank you. Is there a second? A uh, second by member Balatayo. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joe Malin Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Last program proposal is from Contra Costa County Office of Education for a preliminary administrative services program. Joining us to answer any questions you may have about the proposed program for Contra Costa COE are Julie Dooley, ELA, ELD coordinator and administrative leadership program coordinator, Marsha Tokuyoshi, Senior Director, Educational Services, and Carol Laughlin, ALP Leadership Coach. Are there any recusals on this item? Okay. Any member of the public wish to offer a comment? Not seeing any. All right, thank you. Any community member have any questions for the representatives from Contra Costa COE? Seeing none. All right, well, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the Contra Costa County Office of Education's Preliminary Administrative Services Program? Uh, looks like there is a motion. I'm sorry, screen, changing screens. I saw a hand go up. Oh, there is uh, Member Hill Hillis. Will you please state your motion. God move that we accept uh, the proposal to approve the preliminary administrative services credential for the Contra Costa County Office of Education. Great, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. 
All right. So we have a motion and a second. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Elmos. Aye. Jomaline Blatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Paul Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much for joining us. It's short and sweet. Sorry we kept you waiting a little bit, but we appreciate your patience. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item seven. Item seven is a report of program status changes. It's divided into two parts. Part one includes items for action by the COA, <clears throat> which include requests to withdraw, requests to reactivate inactive programs, and or request to add a new content area to an existing program. Part two provides information on programs that have transitioned to revised program standards and programs that have elected to change to inactive status. These items are for notification only and require no action by the COA. Part one, sections A, B, and C. Section A, program withdrawals. Section A is for action. There are two program sponsors withdrawing two programs. California State Poly University Pomona is requesting to withdraw its reading and literacy added authorization program effective June 21st, 2021. And California State University Los Angeles is requesting to withdraw its clear administrative services credential program effective June 30th, 2021. Any member of the public wish to offer a comment? Saying no comment. Thank you. This section is for action. Are, are there any recusals? All right, seeing none, is there a motion from a committee member? A member Larson. I move that we accept the recommendation for the withdrawal of the professional preparation programs for California State Polytechnic University Pomona for their specialist teaching, reading, and literacy added authorization effective June 21st, 2021. And for California State University Los Angeles Clear Administrative Services effective June 30th, 2021. Great, thank you. Well stated. Is there a second? Second. Second. Yeah, thank you. Second by Member Taylor. There. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Elmans. Aye. Jomaline Bolotayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Bob Bradley. Aye. Mike Phyllis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin T. Aye. 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 Motion. And carries. Thank you. Uh, section B, programs requesting reactivation. There are no programs requesting reactivation at this time. Section C, adding a new content area. There are no institutions requesting to add a new content area. Moving on to part D sections, I'm sorry, part two sections D and E. They're for notification purposes only and no action is required. Section D, programs transitioning. There are no programs requesting to transition at this time. Section E, programs moving to inactive status. This section again is notification only, no action is required. There are four program sponsors moving five programs to inactive status. These are Baldwin Park Unified School District, Teacher Induction, effective June 22nd, 2021. Bard College, preliminary single subject, music, effective August 15, 2021. California State University, Los Angeles, Reading and Literacy Leadership Specialist, effective June 30th, 2021, and Reading and Literacy Added Authorization, effective June 30th, 2021, and Point Loma Nazarene University, Teacher Induction, effective June 21st, 2021. That concludes item seven. Moving on to item eight, it's the initial program approval for new program sponsors. There are no new program sponsors seeking program approval at this time. Moving forward to item nine. Item nine is discussion of institutions not in compliance with the accreditation timelines. Analyst Michelle Bernardo will please present or will present the item. Any member of the public wish to comment on the item? 
All right, Ms. Bernardo. For item nine, I just have a quick update from last, the last meeting, um, last May meeting for Pasadena Unified School District. They um, were late uh, submitting their preconditions and um, they did submit an incomplete, um, uh, they did have an incomplete submission and we have asked them to resubmit. Um, it seems that they've submitted a PDF copy of their preconditions. So we've asked them to resubmit and um, staff has uh, continued to work with them to um, get those uh, preconditions in, um, in the format that we've requested. And that's the only update we have for um, for this item. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Again, last Thank opportunity. You. Any member of the public wish to make a comment? All right, thank you. Um, we do have a 9.30 time certain, which is item 10. And I know we've been going since 8.30. I'm going to propose that we keep moving forward and see if we can squeeze in a five-minute break, perhaps at some point in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, if that's all right with everyone, um, because we do have some folks who have been waiting. So let's move on to item 10. Item 10 is the report of the Provisional Site Visit Accreditation Team to High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Administrator Aaron Sullivan and Consultant Poonam Betty, pardon me, uh, will introduce the item. Joining them is Team Lead Jill Hamilton Bunch and Institutional Representatives Dr. Kelly Wilson, Dean, Carol Battle, Multiple Subject Program Manager, Dr. Sarah Fine, Program Manager, and Haley Murragessen. Did I say it pronounced it? Murragessen, Murragessen, Director of Student Affairs? Murragessen. All right, thank you. And then uh, thank you so much for joining us and for your patience. Um, any community member need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Badai, will you please begin? Yes. Good morning, committee members. It is with great pleasure that I begin the first of the site visit reports for today's COA meeting. Item 10 presents the report of the provisional site visit accreditation team to the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Um, Aaron and I were co-consultants on the visit and we cannot thank the High Tech High Graduate School of Education team enough for their openness with this provisional site visit process and also their constant nature of self-reflection which is just inbuilt um, within the institution. And we'd also like to thank the provisional site visit team which includes Jill, our team lead, who you will hear from momentarily, um, Amy, who was our program reviewer, and Lori, who was our common standards reviewer. It was really a pleasure to work with all of them, and they really are a solid team. So as Erin mentioned earlier in her staff report, a provisional site visit occurs during stage five of the initial institutional approval process. And this is, again, the process by which an institution becomes a fully commission approved institution. And just to kind of briefly reiterate what Aaron said earlier, um, the entire team reviews the institution's responses to the program standards and to the common standards. And the commission staff review the preconditions. So all of that feedback goes back um, to the institution. And then the institution responds to that feedback within a month of the provisional site visit. So ultimately we can really think of the provisional site visit as a truncated version of years four to six of the full seven year accreditation cycle. And um, keeping that context in mind, again, I kind of want to go back to that question um, that Aaron um, posed earlier. So when the COA looks at uh, the provisional site visit accreditation reports, it's really looking at it from the lens of what would be the COA's accreditation decision for the institution if they were an institution in the full seven year accreditation cycle. And um, with that in mind, I'd like to turn this presentation over to Jill. 
Thank you, Poonam. And I want to begin by thanking um, the High Tech High team, as well as Aaron and Poonam for their leadership. As Poonam said, and Aaron talked about earlier in the meeting, this is a, a quicker version. Um, so the turnaround times are very um, close together. And the High Tech High team was very responsive and um, just absolutely so uh, good to work with, as well as our team and Aaron and Poonam led us through this process that was new to the team, as well as to High Tech High, and they were just incredibly helpful and um, dedicated to the work. So thank you for that. Um, as Poonam said, this was a provisional site visit, um, and I want to share just some highlights of that. I know you've read the report. Um, one of the things that the team wanted to bring to the forefront was just the commitment of High Tech High um, to teaching excellence and equity, um, thoughtful instruction, and deep reflection. Those came up over and over again in documentation and interviews with candidates and with master teachers, community members, and it was just really the hallmark of our time at High Tech High. Um, the other kind of standout was the community support for this program. Um, in review and in conversation with the advisory board, I have rarely heard such high praise um, for the product of the candidate who is entering public schooling. So um, we were just very impressed with that. It was really uh, just gratifying to hear that kind of feedback from those who are receiving the candidates in the field. And finally, the consistency of commitment to the mission was just very clear from the first moment we walked on campus, virtual campus, um, to the moment that we left. There was just a very consistent um, message, a consistent mission from the start of the review to the end that just showed a, a consistency of commitment to the mission within the program. Our findings are for accreditation with stipulations, and as you know from reading the report, um, that is based on the TPEs for health and physical education not being completely met in documentation review, as well as in uh, interviews with candidates and uh, community stakeholders. Um, so our findings are for the multiple and single subject preliminary programs, and I will turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, um, we now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you, this is not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts that you have about the visit. Thank you, and good morning to everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, I will just echo a couple things real quick. Um, one, this visit, we were we were not expecting it to be as productive and supportive as it felt, but it actually really felt like a a step uh, that supported our work as, a, as an early stage program and our work toward continuous improvement um, and program development, which was just a, a lovely surprise. So we wanted to thank um, Aaron and Poonam as well as Jill and the team for that. Um, and I would say that the stipulation feels very fair to us. We are already working to address it. Um, so we actually sent a memo to the team, which we're happy to make available to the COA about our plans to more fully include and address um, the health and physical education TPEs. We are planning in our year next year to have a one credit three uh, course session module for our candidates to receive support in health and edu uh, physical education. And during that time, they are also gonna have a little bit of a tweak in their clinical experience. It's a year long residency. So we have some time to play with and we are gonna have candidates during those three weeks um, do a rotation through health and phys ed um, in their clinical sites so that they have a chance to actually put into practice um, the theory that they are learning and, and what they're talking about. Um, we are working on a syllabus development. We already have a course instructor identified. So we're sort of in the process at this point of making sure that we're addressing the stipulation and we were happy to follow up in six months time to show more fully kind of what our plan looks like for that. And we, we really welcome that push, I think, as an early program. There are so many TPEs and uh, we, that one kind of got lost in the shuffle. So we're grateful for the push to make sure that we're including it. Thank you, Dr. Fine. And as far as your um, memo, I think it's certainly good, appropriate to just go ahead and include it as part of the record. So next time we see you come before the committee, uh, it'll be part of the record at that point. But thank you for the offer. Um, any other committee member? I'm sorry, any me member of the uh, institution wish to offer a comment?
All right, seeing none, uh, committee members, an opportunity for you to ask any questions you may have. Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. I think Was there any? Hey, Mike Hillis, yes. Oh, there's the hand. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I remember Hillis. Uh, yeah, just really quick. Yeah, I, I've always been uh, very impressed with High Tech High's uh, commitment to your uh, <clears throat> uh, problem-based um, learning approach, and and um, it's it's a very impressive program. One of the things I'm curious about is I was thinking about it from a uh, certification standpoint is because you, because it's part of the certification for somebody to then move on to another kind of school, um, I'm curious how you think about that in terms of how well they're prepared to go into schools that don't share the same uh, philosophy. And it's just more of a, a question of curiosity more than anything else. Thank you for the question. I, I would say that's something we have been thinking about a lot from the very start of our program because we, although our intent was always to capitalize on the coherence of the model at High Tech High, we, we certainly never thought of ourselves only as preparing teachers for project-based schools or only for High Tech High schools. And as we grow, of course, that's becoming more and more a reality for us that we're sending folks beyond um, our own district. So. I think we're, I mean, you're welcome to take a closer look at our accreditation website if you'd like to see, but we, we're working really hard inside of our coursework and our clinical to help candidates see the ways that deeper learning competencies can be embedded in lessons and units and also can be in service of projects, right? But projects, like we're trying to help them understand the way that projects are a way of organizing the work that that we think are a particularly ambitious and important way, but are not the only way to organize work that is about justice and about deeper learning and about rich thinking. And so we draw on the traditions, for example, of complex instruction, of problem-based learning, right? And problem-based learning has a lot of relationships to project-based learning, but can live inside of more traditionally organized schools. So we're, we're really working, I think, to try to make sure that our candidates feel that they have tools that can be adapted and, and can be flexed. And so that if they are in a project-based learning school, they know how to design projects, they can capitalize on the opportunities that that provides, but also they have those tools that can be embedded in, in a multitude of contexts. Great, thank you very much. Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I was, I was interested. I mean, I, I, I think um, Member Hills's question is, is related to mine in that, you know, we're all members of this network, particularly in, the, in this region. And so um, the experiences that your candidates have with you will transfer regardless of where they end up working. And that made me think of teacher residency. And I know you've got this residency component of your program, which is not the same as how the Commission on Teacher Credentialing defines residency for the purpose of these grants. But I was just curious about um, your potential interest in that initiative. I mean, is that something that might advance your cause? It seems to align with, um, the way you're trying to create a vertical pathway for educators who will uh, ultimately earn their um, clear credentials if they go through induction with you. Yeah, I think we are interested and I'd be happy to defer to um, our Dean as well on this, but we, I mean, we do see ourselves as a residency in the sense that we have an extended clinical experience. We offer a living stipend for our residents. They have this tight coherence between coursework and their clinical sites. Um, and then they continue with us beyond because they earn a master's degree in their second year. So they have a kind of extended set of supports. The only piece we're missing really, and we have an induction program run through our partner, our LEA as well, which is again, very coherent with our program. The only thing I think that's missing is the piece around a, like a formalized partnership with a, with a large district um, and with some sort of reciprocity around employment in that district. And it's something we're very interested in and also aware that we're positioned, you know, in a particular way as a charter district. So it's, it's something we'd love to keep talking about. Um, Kelly, is there something you, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just add that we've also done a lot of research um, and leaned on our colleagues at Learning Policy Institute to really learn about the financial modeling of residency programs. So we now offer an $8,000 living stipend. We've had a lot of success within the 16 high-tech high schools and grow your own strategies to address 
the pipeline issue around teachers of color. So about 60% of our alumni identify as people of color. And we'd love to see more partnership, grow your own strategies working um, beyond um, our schools. And that's part of our um, strategy and kind of growth plan looking ahead. I thank you all. Any other committee member have any comment or question? All right, any member of the public wish to comment? Okay, hearing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion from the committee? Um, Chair, um, sorry, Chair Farley, um, Anna Moore was moving her hand and I think I saw Kevin Taylor's hand up earlier as well. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, my, it's freezing just a bit on my end. So let's go co-chair Moore. Thank you. I was just saying, uh, that Kevin had a comment. I was trying to. All right, so we pass on to Kevin, Member Taylor. Thank you. I was just interested. Did you say sixteen percent of your candidates are candidates of color, or sixty percent are uh, candidates? Sixty. Of color? 60 yeah. Sixty percent. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. All right, any other committee member? All right, this is an action item. Is there a motion from a member of the committee? Member Balataya. I move that we accept the report of the recommendation of accreditation with stipulations for high tech high. Right. Thank you. Is there a second? Member Tchaikovsky, I can't tell if your hand is up, but it might be my computer is frozen. Kathy has her hand up. Oh, Kathy. Uh, Member Kreischer, is your hand up there? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stop my video. I think that's what's making things glitch right now. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amos. Aye. Joe Malene Bulatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Thank Wilson, Ms. Battle, Dr. Fine, Dr. Marigason. I hope I'm getting closer. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Hamilton Bunch, Ms. Sullivan, and Ms. Badai. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And just as a reminder, COA members will take this report also before the commission, hopefully at its August meeting, um, and, uh, and the other provisional site visit reports, and we'll find a way to sort of provide you an update then at a future COA meeting to let you know the status of these institutions and um, what kind of what kind of follow-up we'll be, we'll be bringing to you. Great, thanks Aaron for clarifying. Um, I'm gonna recommend we take a five minute break. I know we do have a 945 time certain, but we've been at it for a little while. So let's do a stretch break and we'll come back at 1015. Thank you. Thank you all for coming back. We are going to move on to item 11. Item 11 is the report of the accreditation team to Davis Joint Unified School District. Mr. Hart Boyd and Ms. Christina Najaro will join, well, sorry, will introduce this item. And joining them are team lead Barbara Howard and institutional representatives Constance Best, Executive Director of the Yolo Solano Center for Teacher Credentialing, Teacher Induction and CTE Program Director, Juliana Sykes, Intern Programs Director, and Grant Ermis, CTE and KTIP Program Director. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Mr. Boyd, will you please begin? And let's see if we have everybody on. Yeah. I'm bringing them in, Cheryl. I'm bringing okay. them in right now. Sorry, I don't have my video on. 
You're fine. I just <laughs> no Thanks, wanted man. to make sure we had everybody we needed first. Yeah. Oh, I suppose I should start with Hart. My apologies. Yeah, I was going to say, he's the one I can't see. <laughs> I know. There we go. There we all come. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for the clunky uh, intro, everyone. No, that was <laughs> super smart. Hard whenever you're ready, you can begin. Great, thanks. Davis Joint Unified School District site visit took place from April 25th through the 28th. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the site visit was conducted virtually rather than in person. A total of 267 interviews were conducted with various stakeholders and the site visit proceeded in accordance with all normal accreditation protocols. The team at Davis Joint Unified was great to work with and they were all extremely thorough and thoughtful in their preparation for the site visit. I would like to take a moment to express my deep gratitude to Connie Best and Taryn Tyrell who we primarily worked with over the year. Joining us today via technology and representing Davis Joint Unified are Connie Best, Juliana Sykes and Grant Ermis. Also joining us today is the site visits team lead, Barbara Howard. Barbara was fantastic to work with and was an extremely knowledgeable and thoughtful leader throughout the process. I would also like to thank each of the members of our site visit team for contributing their time and expertise to the visit. The team worked diligently in preparation for the visit and worked extremely hard during the visit. Finally, I would like to give a special thanks to Christina Naharo who served as a secondary consultant on this visit and brought invaluable insight and perspective to this process. I'll stop now and turn it over to Barbara who will present the findings and the accreditation recommendation. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, I would just like to also add my thanks this morning to Anna Moore. Uh, Anna and I worked together in this uh, teacher preparation world for decades, and, and I'm so appreciative of all that you've done for, for our world and our work. So thank you and congratulations. Um, it is an indeed an honor to report out on the accreditation site visit of the Davis Joint Unified School District's teacher preparation programs. As uh, Hart said, uh, the visit proceeded in accordance with all the normal processes, if anything about COVID is truly normal, right? But we did uh, have a great virtual visit. Uh, the team and institutional stakeholders were interviewed via technology. Uh, Davis sponsors five programs, so we were a seven-person team in addition to our wonderful uh, consultants. And that being said, I really do want to thank Hart and Christina for their outstanding uh, facilitation of this process. Um, a huge thanks to Joe Frescatori, Bridget Mont, Sylvia Mack, Betsy McKinstry, Heather Peterson, and Katie Reed for their thorough preparation and their conscientious work throughout the visit. Each one brought a true expertise and worked very hard. A uh, special thanks also go to Connie uh, and her team, Taryn, Juliana, Grant. They tirelessly prepared in advance of the visit, which I will say at included hundreds of Zoom rooms and Zoom links. Thanks to Taryn for that great work. Uh, Connie, Juliana, and Grant were exceptionally responsive to our questions and requests for clarification. I think it's important to note that their responsiveness was especially remarkable in light of the fact that schools had just reopened the week of the visit. So the logistics truly were remarkably smooth due to their exceptional work and preparation. So thank you. They were a joy, true joy to work with. The team thoroughly reviewed the program's documents and conducted interviews with all constituent groups, including district leadership. In the examination of this evidence, the team found that all common and program standards were met with the exception of teacher induction program standard three. During the interview process, candidates, completers, and mentors were overwhelmingly positive. Um, and that's always so fun when that is the case and it truly was. They talked about the availability of program leadership to address any need or question and very importantly, they spoke about experiencing a strong system of personalized mentoring and support. In all of Davis's programs, the mentors are trained utilizing the same 
system, the Mentoring Matters approach. This consistency across programs provides continuity and a common language that promotes the continuous strengthening of the mentoring process. Many, many candidates and completers and even the mentors commented about the enormous value of the supportive mentoring process. As you saw in the report, the teacher induction program has two delivery models. One of them serves the general education and special education teachers, I suppose we'd say the more traditional route. And the second one is uh, what we call the, the KTIP program, which is designed to meet the unique needs of the state's agriculture teachers. That was the one area that was found to be met with concerns. It is really important to say that every candidate and completer in the KTIP program was extremely grateful and appreciative to have a program that was very much designed and aligned specifically for their unique context. Um, there's a strong community in the ag teacher world, which um, I really enjoyed becoming acquainted with during this visit. That, that supportive culture translates into a serious commitment on their part to positively onboard their new teachers. Um, the area, however, that was identified as a concern was related to the types of activities and assignments that were required of every candidate in addition to the ILP. The program standard three states that the ILP must address the CSTP and provide the roadmap for the candidates induction work during their time in the program. The current program pathway documentation um, calls for a list of activities required PD and a grading system that play a large role a larger role in driving the program than the ILP. This led to the determination that the ILT was not the driving force behind the candidate's induction experience, which resulted in the finding of met with concerns. Again, it is important to say though, those candidates were so appreciative of that amazing mentoring and support that they received. So uh, the team already began to address that even while we were there. I want to comment also on the district's visionary leaders. They really have created a culture in the district and therefore in the region that provokes, promotes innovative learning. The superintendent spoke about his strong commitment to the work of the center. He stated that it's at the heart of the district's commit, commitment to excellent and in, excellence and innovation. In innovation. Several of the cabinet members spoke about the value of these programs in their efforts to diversify the educator workforce within the region. Uh, the approved intern programs provide a pipeline for their very strong California Classified School Employee Teacher Credential and Grant Program. The classified workforce, of course, shares that similar diversity in student population and is therefore allowing them to build and employ a more diversified teach for, teaching force. The deputy uh, district superintendent described a partnership with the National Equity Project that is supporting their intent to recruit and hire for diversity. And I, I was especially touched by this um, also. Uh, they have collaborative communities for teachers of color, beginning teachers of color that are in place to assist in the retention of those teachers. Strong evidence of an excellent teacher preparation experience was uncovered in so many ways during this visit. Therefore, the team unanimously recommends accreditation for the Davis Joint Unified School District. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Howard. Also, thank you, Mr. Boyd. Um, this is now an opportunity to institutional representative to make any comment about the visit. Remind you, it's not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts that you may have about the visit itself. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, first, I just have a couple of things. Again, I just want to thank the team. It was a large team and just worked so smoothly, um, surprisingly, given our Zoom experience that we've all recently encountered. But I just really appreciated the support that we received over the course of the year from Art and from Christina and the, the success of our team working collaboratively within our center along with conversations in the collaborative spirit of our other induction and intern directors around our cluster really made for things to run smoothly and uh, feel confident going into our site review. Uh, one of the things that I'm sure you've noted once you've read the report 
or as you were reading it, that our center has grown immensely in a very short amount of time. And that was in response to what our region needed, what we heard from our districts. We're unique in that we are operated out of a district office, but we operate very much like a county office program. We are a consortium um, spanning counties. And so in response to what our districts needed, and thankfully, as Kara mentioned earlier, the availability of grants, we were able to really address the teacher shortage in our, that our schools were experiencing, mainly with our special education. And then lastly, um, what I did want to say is that it was a pleasure to work with Barbara, and we had many discussions about the KTIP, which was our newest program um, that was an add-on. And so over the course of the last two years in our program, we have worked to better align that program to our traditional induction program. And so we really appreciated the feedback and how it was received and perceived by other people in order to help move our efforts forward in that work. So we really appreciated that and the process of the site review. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Best. Any other member of the institution wish to offer comment? Uh, yes, thank you. I just uh, want to thank the team. I mean, it really was a very thorough process. And, you know, one of the things that came forward, I think, from our candidates and all of our stakeholders within the interim program was um, how much the site visit team was invested in hearing their experiences in our interim preparation program and really and how it reflected the ways in which we have aligned our program to the standards. And you know, we had no idea when our program was initially approved just uh, a little over two years ago, you know, how it would become a service to the region. And you know, we have recently graduated 25 more interns this year that will receive their preliminary credentials. And so we're really pleased to be um, addressing the teacher shortage in our region and providing quality teachers in the fields of multiple subject and special education. Thank you, Ms. Sykes. Any other member of the institution wish to offer comment? I'll offer comment really quickly. Just uh, a thanks to my team for uh, bringing on the KTIP program and taking it under their wing. And for the educational experience, I appreciate everything from Barbara and team and Hart, and everybody at the commission for helping guide us through the process. It was educational. We learned a lot and we're ready to move forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hermes. Any member of the uh, public wish to offer a comment? Seeing no comments, Bob. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? A member more. Um, Barbara, thank you for your comments. Um, I, it has been decades and, and I'm sure I have another decade in me, so I hope our paths cross again and that we get to work together some more in the future. Um, I love this report. It was very succinct, easy to read. It filled all the, you know, if you have a little question, it was answered in the next sentence or in the next paragraph. Um, I really felt like I, it just, it was very thorough and succinct and wow, <laughs> Davis, you're doing, doing some amazing things. Um, just to start with the fact that you did this, Barbara, thank you for sharing that schools were opening being a site administrator myself, um, I know what those first couple of weeks are were like um, as we were opening and it was so amazingly intense. And the fact that you were doing this in conjunction, you were to be commended um, for your attention to detail. And I'm sure late hours um, after taking care of the needs of your sites and the people at your sites and um, all those other things, uh, I, I can't even imagine. Um, and the fact that you are so attentive to the needs of your community is, is again, I know we've, you've said it in the report and in your comments, but you're in, you, you just, you reach out, you listen, and, and you make it happen. This KTIP program is innovative and responsive and super exciting. And uh, I'm sure there's other stuff in the works um, as you get that feedback from your stakeholders and you'll go, yep, that's what we need to do to make sure that everybody's needs are met. Um, that is, is really one of the foundational cores of accreditation and um, as we move forward with this um, process. 
And the last thing, it really, I was just so impressed by this last statistic, the last line of this report, which, which reads, over 75% of current induction mentors were previous DG, uh, DJ USD completers, and of the remaining 25%, many have been mentors since the beginning of the original induction program. I, that just speaks volumes. Uh, it's good, of course, to get new people involved, but the fact that people love the process and they believe in it so much that they want to be part of the program, um, even when they could just move on and go into tenure and relax, they don't. It's all about professional growth and moving forward and supporting those mentors in a way that makes them want to be part of the um, grow our own and support our own process. Um, well done. Thank you, Co-Chair Moore. Uh, Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, um, echoing um, Anna's comments. And, you know, whenever I read a report like this, where this particular met with concerns pops up, I'm interested in that because um, clearly, as Anna said, this KTIP program has a lot in it. It's rigorous. It's, it's substantive. And it sounds like from this report that your candidates find it valuable. So as a member of the COA, again, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with the fact that it was met with concerns because it went beyond the ILP. I can understand the, the reason for being wary of programs cobbling together requirements beyond the ILP, but clearly what you are doing is not burdensome to your people. It's providing coherence in a geographically wide, varied environment. It seems to me very appropriate that, that content beyond the ILP would bolster a sense of community, solidarity, and, and common culture within your district. So I just have to say that for consideration by all of us moving forward, and, and again, by way of commending you for embedding induction within a fabric of training and acculturation that is clearly netting you some powerful results for your kids. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Member Tchaikovsky. Uh, and just as a quick reminder to the committee members, we do have a table, one that uh, Michelle had forwarded to us last week. Just we already have that as reference, but it's just a, a steps that we can take as the COA and things to be considered um, regarding accreditation decisions, consequent institution activities. Remember that uh, this is certainly up for discussion. So if there are some points that we believe we'd like to go ahead and ask for the clarification on, um, we can certainly do so. Um, having said that, uh, Ms. Howard, would you like to comment at all on Member Tchaikovsky's question regarding the stipulation? Sure. Great, with, great, great question. And it was, uh, as Hart and Christina can testify to, we talked and talked and talked about this. The, the basis for that was that we actually did hear from some candidates. They loved the mentoring, but that there was a lot of, ex there was a lot of work. So there was a, a voice of Burdensome maybe is a bit strong, but what we also talked about was that it it seemed like it hadn't quite aligned with the new 2016 induction standards, that it was still really looking a lot more like an old um, kind of paperwork heavy program. So really our recommendation was just to adjust some of that in the spirit of um, aligning with those standards, not mandating that things be done, but offering more of a, of a notion of choice for those candidates. Um, so that was where our reasoning um, came from on the Met with Concerns. And I, I will say that the, you know, the overall finding for the program, of course, was full accreditation. Um, and so it, it was just something that we felt like really needed to be, to be addressed. Um, while affirming how valuable the teachers found that. So that's where we came from on that. All right, thank you. Um, any other committee member have any question or comment? Bob, um, if I can yes. just, I, I would just say though that much of what Barbara just explained is sort of a sense of feeling and an interpretation for the record, for us to consider moving forward. I don't think there's anything in the standards that I have seen that precludes supplemental experiences for candidates. I mean, as, as, a, as a line, and, and I may be just revealing my ignorance. So 
clearly I understand the intent. I, I value and respect the time that you were on, you know, on site, Barbara, with your team. Um, but I also um, acknowledge the efforts that the Davis team has invested in creating something that is stronger than um, what it would have been otherwise. So again, I'm not going to belabor my comments here, but I do recognize and appreciate um, what you people are doing out there. Well, thank you, Member Kanchakowski. You, your your comments are, are appropriate and well noted. Um, do we have any other comment regarding this specific, uh, specific point that uh, Katrina has brought up? Yeah, Member Taylor. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> COVID times, you're muted. Um, uh, not so much the specific point uh, that Katina brought up, but I, I do want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, the Davis Joint Union uh, and, and uh, um, Anna Moore's comment, particularly they seem to have risen to their community needs. Uh, um, uh, in the areas of special education and, and, and ag. And um, I know something about ag education being at Cal Poly, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the strength of that community um, uh, is, um, is something to behold. And really uh, the commitment of KTEP, uh, it, it, it's a commitment to career long professional development. Um, and they really do go uh, above and beyond um, and uh, I, I think um, uh, that that's something to uh, for us as teacher educators, as people in the uh, the com education uh, community, to to really admire and support. Uh, uh, teacher preparation is not just initial preparation. Teacher education continues throughout uh, the career, um, and I think uh, the the programs here do a good job of uh, reflecting that. So uh, congratulations um, on, uh, on a great, great report and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Member Taylor. So as a reminder, the recommendation of the team report is with accreditation, with the one uh, met with concerns, but that wouldn't negate at all the recommendation of having it, uh, the institution be accredited. So are there any further comments? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? And if there's a desire to go ahead and and perhaps have met, met with concerns be removed, this would be the opportunity within the motion itself or Cheryl, I'm just ask for clarification. Is that something that's even on the table or no? Can I jump in with a second? The commission or the committee on accreditation cannot change the standard findings. Got you it, can okay, thank accreditation you. Accreditation recommendation, but you cannot change the um, um, met with concerns. Okay, thank you, that's what I was wondering. All right, thank you. So then we have, we either have a, a recommendation uh, based upon uh, the team's findings of accreditation. Um, Member Chagowski. Yeah, I move that we um, accept the recommendation um, for accreditation um, by, for the Davis Joint Unified School District. All right, thank you. So moved, is there a second? Second by Member Hillis. Secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jomeline Bolatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Bob Freely. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. I will say, I one of my early site visits I did as part of the team um, was to Davis. I think it was 2012. I think you might have had that. Um, wonderful time. I mean, I found the programs to be so thorough, so thought-provoking, so very much caring for the students. Um, their hospitality was great, and I've never seen a city with more cupcake stores per capita than Davis. I mean, you walk two two doors down, and there's another cupcake joint. Um, but I just had a great time. So again, it's nice to see you come again before the committee. Congratulations, well deserved. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Ms. Bess, Ms. Sykes, uh, Mr. Ermis, Ms. Howard, Ms. Naharo, and Mr. Hart. Thank you all. All right. We, I, we recognize we are behind schedule. Uh, we had a lot to cover earlier in the morning, but we do want to move on to item 12 and, and appreciate the patience of those who are in waiting. 
Item 12 is a report of the accreditation team to Sutter County, Superintendent of Schools. Consultant Bob Locks will introduce the item, and joining him is team lead Connie Campbell and institutional representatives Lisa Galt, Director, Elizabeth Heinberger, Program Manager, and Rachel Meacham, Program Manager. Anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Mr. Locks, will you please begin? Thank you. The site visit to Sutter Superintendent of Schools was held April 26th to 28th, all virtually. There were no other unusual circumstances and the team failed to obtain a full understanding of all programs that Sutter offers. This institution has a very strong connection with the community and their neighboring counties. They are continuously discussing their programs with their constituents and using their feedback for program improvement. Team lead Connie Campbell will now review the recommendation of the site visit team. Thank you. Good morning. I begin by thanking Bob Lux for his leadership on this visit and to the Sutter County leadership. It's good to see you here this morning. Lisa Galt, Elizabeth Heinberger, and Rachel Metcham. They prepared beautifully and remained very reflective throughout our interaction. Uh, what is unique and notable about the Sutter County Superintendent of Schools TIP program is that they are a consortium that encompasses Sutter, Palooza, and the counties. Um, that means 26 districts and three county offices of education to whom they offer teacher ed induction, career technical education, and the clear administrative services credential. Uh, the evidence from documents and interviews we experienced consistently show that Sutter County Superintendent of Schools hosts effective programs centered on relevant job embedded learning for candidates. Although the programs serve candidates geographically spread across a wide area, it was very clear the program staff takes the time to individualize the experience for their candidates. All stakeholders spoke from different perspectives about the effort by program leadership to create a personal and relevant experience for those candidates. These personal connections are also at the core of collaboration with advisory committees and interaction with P-12 employers and universities. The program has clearly engaged in continuous improvement over the past year, prompted by a change in leadership. Despite programmatic and leadership changes, candidates feel extremely well supported. The program is currently building its advisory committee capacity and influence with stakeholders. Uh, from P-12 and higher education to receive regular feedback about the program and to consider any recommended changes. Also notable is the program has started to place additional focus on purposeful recruitment of candidates to diversify the educator pool and already has effective methods to provide support for their success. A few important anecdotes. Interviews with CTE stakeholders shared the program has significantly improved the retention of CTE teachers in the field. That is a win right there. Also, CASC employers agreed the program equips CASC candidates with the strategies and leadership qualities that were vital for the uncommon 2020 COVID year. Also a win. So, um, on to the findings. Um, all program standards for teacher induction and career technical education were met. One of the standards for the clear administrative services credential, standard two program collaboration, communication and coordination was met with concerns and all other program standards were met and all common standards were met. So based upon a thorough review of all available and relevant institutional and program documentation, as well as all supporting evidence, including interviews with representative constituencies, a recommendation of accreditation is made for Sutter County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, and nice to see you twice in one day, this time on the other side of the fence. Thank you. So thank you. Um, we now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you this is not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts that you had about the visit. Thank you, and thank you for having us. On behalf of our Tri-County team, we'd like to thank the committee for considering our programs for accreditation and for the CTC for continuing to provide a platform for expectations of continuous improvement. We truly learned a lot 
uh, just by digging deeper into the standards than we might possibly have otherwise um, and looking through the lens of others. So we greatly appreciate um, this opportunity. We wanna thank the accreditation site visit team, Bob and Connie for taking all of our questions and phone calls and answering our emails um, while supporting us throughout this process. Stacy and John and Vicki and Samantha, part of our team um, were amazing as well. Having that opportunity to meet with them prior to our actual um, visit really lessened our um, anxiety of the process. Um, just having, just seeing faces and having conversations and um, getting to know one another as well as we can over this virtual platform. We thank you for that. A uh, big shout out to um, Sinclair Research Group. Bill and Lois met with us on several occasions. They were also our little supporters through this process, um, supporting us in adapting our addendum and making some changes to that. So thank you. Um, and of course, our internal team, including our IT department, with um, the Zooms and us being a, a consortium um, meeting lots of different needs in different communities. Uh, are, we were a little nervous about the Zoom to say the least. So that, that uh, heightened our anxiety. And so we're grateful that um, we have the IT department standing behind us. As a result of the findings, uh, we right away, um, we so appreciated all the feedback we had and we appreciate that final opportunity to just chat with other members outside of our community as to the induction programs for all three of our programs. For standard two of our CAS program, listening to what the feedback was, and then we had a follow-up meeting with our advisory committee. We have that MOU developed that we had um, discussed to, uh, to tie into standard two. So without this opportunity, that may have taken us a year or two to figure that out as a new program for CAS. So thank you for that information. And once again, on behalf of our team, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Galt. Any other member of the institution wish to offer comment? All right, seeing none, any member of the public wish to offer a comment? Seeing none, Bob. Thanks, Michelle. Any, uh, any questions or comments then from committee members? Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I'm just um, congratulations, and I'm I'm I was just interested also in in that MOU or next steps that you plan to take. How, how have you responded to this call for greater partnership? We actually had an MOU prior to um, to this year. This is the third year of our of the CAS program um, because it was individualized. We had just made some individualized meeting. The CAS candidates come to us on their you know, it's not from a district, it's chosen. Um, we didn't recognize the significance of including the superintendents. Although they're in talks with us, we didn't understand the significance behind a contract. Since then, in talking to our um, stakeholders, we, we pulled that MOU back out and we have um, re-implemented that, but with following up with the direct supervisors, not just the superintendents of where they're located, but with their supervisor, him or herself. Oh yeah, I would imagine that would be really important um, and that you've learned a lot about meeting the needs of individual candidates just through having that relationship. That sounds good to me. Thank you, Member Bellatayo. Hello, good afternoon. Or rather, are we, well, we're still a good morning. Um, can you speak more to how you plan on strengthening the role of the advisory committee to the Tri-County Induction Program? We actually started the advisory committees in the, actually CTE at the beginning of the year, but the other two started in the winter. So we're doing quarterly meetings. Um, as the, actually the advice of our team, they made the suggestion of, because we have three separate uh, advisory meet committees that we started this year. We're going to combine them at the beginning of the year with a kickoff breakfast. And just because our vision and mission is the same, um, just to kind of meet each other and talk about what the needs of each program are. And then we'll branch out with, uh, they really appreciate the virtual meetings. COVID has been good for some different feedback than we've had in the past. So we'll continue with three follow-up virtual meetings with the individual program needs themselves. They're supporting us with feedback that we're receiving from the Sinclair Research Group, feedback that we get from our candidates and um, mentors off of uh, 
forms that we send them to collect some information. Um, they're helping us when we make a shift or a change to our ILP or, or IIP or growth plan um, based again off of feedback or trends that we're seeing candidates um, experiencing, we will take that to our advisory committee as well so that they can give input to changes or program um, shifts that we might have. Okay. Thank you. And um, another question, please. How are you planning to improve the systems you currently have in place to recruit and admit diverse candidates and give them the necessary help and support to promote their successful entry and retention in the profession? So this was also one of those conversations. We had quite a few conversations with the team about this in regard that um, it, it took a while for it to really resonate with us because we are a hiring agency. We work with the districts that hire in their communities. So through that, we actually took this back to um, the advisory committees and asked for guidance. And it's something we have on our agenda for, for um, the fall as we continue focusing on what this might look like. What is, because again, you, you know, 26 different districts, everybody's uh, hiring process is a little unique and different. So how is, as a group, how do we, um, pull all of that information together to benefit our candidates. Um, in our facilitating group, which we have a, a group that uh, trainers basically that we meet monthly with that support our mentors and candidates as well. In all the programs, we're all doing a book study on coaching for equity. Um, it's an area that we really need to look deeper into. We provide PD in this area. It's something that um, we thought that we were doing. So again, this process was something that opened our eyes to see how would you, you if you were to go onto a web, our website, for example, how would you know that was important to us? So there's little pieces that we have listed on our um, up and coming and working on right now throughout the summer that we're looking to improve our program. And that is, that's one of them, the hiring and the retaining and um, just continuing that process. And that's thanks to the accreditation, actually. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you. Any other committee member wish to offer a comment or question? Okay, seeing uh, none, this is an action item. Is there an action or a motion, pardon me, from a member of the committee? Looking for a hand. I see Lynn Larson. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Member Larson. I move that we uh, accept the recommendation of accreditation for the Sutter County uh, Superintendent of Schools for their teacher induction, career technical education, and clear administrative services credential programs. Great. Thank you, Member Larson. Is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. With the secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jomelaine Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikoski. Aye. Paul Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. That's a, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Ben, thank you for joining us and for your patience. Uh, thank you, Ms. Galt, Ms. Heinberger, Ms. Meacham, uh, Ms. I'm sorry, Meacham, Ms. Campbell, uh, Dr. Campbell, and Mr. Locks. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great day.